This video series is brought to you by the ASU Writing Center within the Academic Support Network. Thank you for joining me as we discuss part four of incorporating evidence. This video is part four of a four-part series. This video, our fourth in the series, will discuss framing evidence. Let's get started. You may have heard your professors ask you to frame your evidence in your writing, but what does this mean? Remember that it's not enough to just quote, paraphrase, or summarize evidence into your paper. You must also connect your evidence to everything else in the paper. Don't let it just float there all by itself. Framing your evidence includes introducing your evidence, telling your readers who said it, when and where, and why you are bringing it up now, analyzing your evidence, telling your readers what you think about that piece of evidence and why, synthesizing that evidence with other sources, telling your readers what those other sources you used would think about that piece of evidence and why, and contextualizing your evidence, telling your readers how that piece of evidence is relevant to your topic, main point, or argument, as well as its larger significance. Let's now discuss each of these examples of framing evidence in more detail. Firstly, Signal phrasing helps you introduce your evidence to a reader. Signal phrases are words and phrases that set up a piece of evidence, transition between pieces of evidence, and transition between evidence and commentary. We will see this term signal phrases coming up throughout the rest of this presentation. Using signal phrasing helps you introduce a piece of evidence to your reader, Differentiate evidence from your own thoughts and commentary. Direct your reader's attention to specific parts of the evidence you want them to pay attention to. And connect evidence you use back to your argument. Some examples of signal phrases might be familiar to you. For example, however, in addition to, X author argues that, Y study found that. In contrast to X, Y states that. Despite Y's assertion that, I claim that. These are all phrases that you probably already use in your writing to signal where you are introducing evidence and where you are introducing your own thoughts. Let's now go over some examples of signal phrasing in action. Take a look at this first sentence. For example, Lewis and Clark found in a 2021 study that many thousands of species of bacteria characterize the human gut microbiome. The parts in bold are example of signal phrasing that introduces that piece of evidence. For example, shows that that piece of evidence about the human gut microbiome is an example of the author's previous point that they were making. And mentioning that it was found in a 2021 study emphasizes that it was found recently, which further emphasizes its significance, that this is a recent discovery. Now let's look at the second sentence. According to Maxwell and Hansen, the chance of a solar flare destabilizing global technology is slim. However, I argue that we must still prepare for that change by building more resilient infrastructure, because the impact of even one solar flare would be devastating. So here the writer uses signal phrasing to differentiate what the source is saying from what they are saying. The first point is introduced with the phrase, according to Maxwell and Hansen, showing that they said it. And the second part is introduced with the phrase, however, I argue that, showing that this is now the author's own viewpoint and that it contrasts to the viewpoint of Maxwell and Hansen. Now let's look at this third sentence. However, other researchers have found that pigs demonstrate complex intelligence. This has led some advocates to argue that they should not be used in medical experimentation. Here, the author is using signal phrasing to direct the reader's attention away from what other researchers have found to what advocates are doing based on that finding. They're again showing a connection between those two pieces of evidence, saying that the research that found that pigs demonstrate complex intelligence has led advocates to argue that they should not be used in medical experimentation. Again, those statements on their own without the bolded parts doesn't really tell much to the reader about 
why the writer is including those pieces of evidence. And finally, let's look at this fourth sentence. As the 2017 IRS report indicates, millions of Americans incorrectly filed their taxes multiple times over the past decade. Their findings show that the government should simplify the tax filing process. Here, the writer is connecting this piece of evidence to their argument. Without the second sentence that's in bold, the reader has no idea why the writer is telling them that millions of Americans have incorrectly filed their taxes. Only with the connection saying that their findings show that the government should simplify the tax filing process, which is the writer's argument, only that sentence shows the significance of that piece of evidence. So these are just some examples of how signal phrasing can help you introduce evidence to your readers and connect your evidence to other points of evidence and to your own argument. Moving on, another example of framing evidence is using analysis. We've already discussed in detail how to write a good analysis in previous sections of this presentation. But to recap, Analysis is your commentary on the evidence that you present. Analysis is also a type of framing. Remember that it's not enough to present evidence on its own. You have to tell your readers what it means and what they should think about it. So analysis helps you tell readers what you think about that piece of evidence, highlight important points from that piece of evidence that they should focus on, Show your readers why that piece of evidence is important and relevant to your main point, topic, or argument. And explain to the reader what a piece of evidence, especially a quote, actually means. You can introduce your analysis in writing with signal phrases, such as, basically, X is saying that. However, Y's claim is questionable because... C makes a controversial but ultimately justifiable point because, again, these are all examples of phrases that you probably already use in your writing to transition from a piece of evidence to your analysis of that evidence. So once again, let's look at a few examples of how to incorporate analysis into your writing. Looking at this first sentence, Although McKinnon is correct in her assessment that high school students have the lowest literacy levels seen in years, she overlooks the crucial fact that the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on their education. So here, the phrases in bold show the audience what the writer thinks of McKinnon's argument. The first part, McKinnon is correct in her assessment, but the second part is that she overlooks the crucial fact. The writer here isn't just presenting McKinnon's findings. They're saying that McKinnon's findings are correct, but overall their work is incomplete. Looking at this next sentence, Byrne asserts that government regulation, public pressure, and internal shifts in corporate culture have pushed businesses to become more environmentally aware in the past decade. Specifically, Byrne's point about the increase in public pressure indicates a significant shift in the conversation around this issue. Here, the writer is highlighting one point from Byrne's evidence that readers should pay attention to and explaining why it is important. The writer first summarizes Byrne's work, saying that government regulation, public pressure, and internal shifts have worked together, but then pulls out public pressure specifically to analyze in their own work. The writer is telling their readers that their analysis is going to focus on that one point of Burns' research. Now looking at this third sentence, Alwyn's findings prove that the FDA has not sufficiently regulated emerging medical implant devices. Here the writer is explaining why the evidence from Alwyn's study is relevant to their argument. Rather than just presenting Alwyn's findings, they add an extra sentence showing that Alwyn's findings prove the argument that they are making. And looking at this final sentence, Levine puts it best when they state, the American public is ready for more substantial, soulful media to engage with. Essentially, they are saying that viewers want their media to be more intentional and thoughtful, even if it takes longer to produce. So here the writer explains the meaning of the quote to their readers, 
putting emphasis on the parts of their quote that are relevant to their own argument. Again, rather than just presenting the quote on its own, the writer presents their own interpretation of the quote and tells their readers what they should think about it. So these are all examples of how analysis can help frame your evidence for your reader. Analysis tells your reader the meaning and significance of the evidence that you present. Moving on, another form of framing evidence is synthesis. Again, we've already covered how to write a good synthesis in previous portions of this series. But to recap, synthesis is connecting multiple pieces of evidence from multiple sources together. Synthesis helps you give readers a complete picture of the conversation around your topic, helps you support your points with a wide foundation of sources, compare the evidence viewpoints and quality of multiple sources, and highlight gaps in the research that you seek to explore or address in your own writing. Synthesis, again, tells your audience why the evidence you are presenting them should matter and why they should care about it. You can introduce your synthesis with signal phrases such as, both X and Y agree that, however, Y diverges from X on the point of, Although many researchers have studied X, there is very little research on Y, as Z points out. As shown by X, Y, and Z, again, these are all phrases that you probably already use in your own writing. So now let's look at some examples of how synthesis is a form of framing evidence. Looking at this first sentence, several researchers, including Sivan and Golker, have found that hospitals across the country have increasingly adopted algorithms as part of the healthcare decision-making process. However, an emerging body of scholarship, for example, recent studies from Perry and Gomez, have challenged the assumption that these algorithms can provide objective data. So here the author summarizes findings from multiple sources and shows how they challenge each other. And this overall gives the reader a sense that there is an ongoing conversation around this topic. Looking at this next sentence, based on recent findings from Knowles, Lipa, and Elliot, as well as the foundational work of James and Franklin, it is clear that greening urban spaces has several tangible and immediate benefits to city residents. Here the writer shows readers how multiple sources contribute evidence to prove their point. Drawing on multiple sources of authority makes their overall point stronger. Readers now know that this isn't just an isolated view, but that a lot of people in the field are coming to the same conclusion. Now let's look at this third sentence. By demonstrating that teenage children also demonstrate increased retention when elements of play are involved in their education, Beam's study expands on Hoop's earlier findings by showing that the same phenomenon occurs in high school as well as elementary classrooms. Here the writer uses synthesis to compare Beam and Hoop's work to each other and show how one study builds on and expands the other. Again, just presenting the findings of these two studies without this additional commentary would not tell the readers much about the relationship between these two studies. Here the writer draws attention to the significance of that relationship. And looking at this final sentence, although Zahner, Morissette, and Welch all address and refute the misconception that multiple vaccinations given simultaneously can cause serious health effects in young children, None of them answer or even ask the question of why parents who are aware of that fact still choose to adopt an alternative vaccination schedule. Here the writer is highlighting a gap that the evidence does not address. This tells the reader that this is an important question that people aren't really looking into yet and that the writer hopes to look into themselves. Final form of framing evidence is contextualizing. It's important to put any evidence you use in the context of your topic, main point, or argument. This helps you tell your readers what your evidence means, show your readers why what you are writing about matters, tell your readers why they should care about your topic, 
and demonstrate the stakes of the evidence that you present to your readers. Connecting your evidence to your topic gets your readers invested in what you're writing about. You can contextualize your evidence using signal phrases such as, ultimately, X's findings show that, although it may seem insignificant, Y's conclusion has huge implications for, the impact of Z's work has so far been quiet, but her findings could affect the lives of ordinary citizens by, and again, these are all phrases that you're probably already using in your writing. So let's once again look at some examples of contextualizing evidence. Looking at this first sentence, Grande and Holbrook found that globally, ocean temperatures have risen significantly since 2000. This means that the majority of the world's coral reefs are facing imminent extinction. So here the writer presents a piece of evidence and then shows readers what that evidence means for their specific topic. The piece of evidence by itself does not tell the reader anything about the writer's topic, but the writer needs that sentence to connect it to their specific topic of coral reefs. Looking at the next sentence, dozens of college news publications have published editorials like Perry's 2015 piece calling for increased accessibility measures across campus in the past decade. This increase in attention to the issue indicates that institutions may soon be pressured to make drastic beneficial changes to better accommodate disabled students. So here the writer is presenting a piece of evidence and then explaining why it matters and what the stakes of the issue are. Why does it matter that dozens of college news publications are publishing articles from students calling for increased accessibility? Well, that increase in attention might indicate that institutions will have to make beneficial changes and make them soon. So what's at stake here is disabled students' access to college education. Looking at this final sentence, it might seem far-fetched to be concerned that, as Musgraves warns, digital clones of ourselves may soon appear on the scene. However, our personal devices already collect a staggering amount of data on our health, preferences, interests, and more just through day-to-day -day use. That worrying future may be closer than we think. So again, the writer presents a piece of evidence and then tells readers why they should care about it. Maybe this is something that readers don't really know about or an issue that they don't really understand. Just telling them what Musgraves warns doesn't necessarily convince them that they should care about it. But telling them that their own lives and their own data might be impacted shows them the significance of that piece of evidence. So these are all examples of how contextualizing your evidence can show readers why it matters. To wrap up this section, here are some tips, strategies, and best practices for framing evidence. Use signal phrasing to connect pieces of evidence to each other, to your analysis, and to the broader context of your topic or argument. Use analysis to explain to your readers what a piece of evidence means for your argument, as well as your thoughts and commentary on it. Use synthesis to connect multiple pieces of evidence from multiple sources to each other, to your analysis, and to your main idea. At the sentence and paragraph level, think of each piece of evidence as being sandwiched by signal phrasing and commentary. Don't let your evidence float out there by itself. When you're revising, ask yourself the question, so what, after reading a quote, paraphrase, or summary of a piece of evidence. Then check whether your next few sentences answer that question. Here are the references that we use to create this presentation. Thank you for joining us to discuss framing evidence. Be sure to check out the online study hub for our other spotlight series covering different writing skills.